kind of do whatever you want this episode, honestly, because there wasn't that much that went down. So if you're if you're like, hey, I'm over it, I'm ready to bounce, just let us know. Uh, but we are going to go over Jonesboro. We do have a wild story of the week. We've got some Edwin stats and a couple listener questions as well to go over. But how's uh, how's both of your guys' week? You first, really? Simon. Simon first. Okay. I, I said it first. Eh. Um, pretty all right. I'm home. I'm still in Massachusetts right now. I'm flying to Memphis tomorrow afternoon. So I kind of have a late arrival in Jonesboro, but it's all good. I've played that course enough times, I think. I always look forward to that one. It's like a really fun course that should suit my game so well, but I never performed there. So I hope to turn things around there for what's for your best finish. I need it. Uh, I think probably my first time ever there. I would guess oh. I got like there, the field wasn't stacked back then. I think it was like 2014, 15. I don't remember even when, what year it was, but I probably got fifth or something. Okay. Maybe yeah, I it got seems like it would be a great there. course. Did I get second ever there? I honestly don't remember. Our, our, our stats guy's options. on it. He'll he'll let you know. Um, but yeah, I'm home, so everything's nice. Family time. I spend a lot of time with my son. My wife is nine months pregnant, so we have 15 days left until the daughter is joining us. Ooh, um, wow. times are pretty tense <laughs> and fun, but all good. So you arrived, Yuli. Are you in Jonesboro right now? I am. Yeah, <clears throat> I actually got here uh early yesterday i actually i actually flew in just in time for brad to get us drive to um jonesboro and watch the eclipse so i got oh. here at like it was like perfect timing which by the way that was wild were you guys in totality yes simon were you in totality up there no mass at like 95 percent. okay so it never got pitch black no oh. I thought the moment right after was the sickest part where the beams were coming off of it. Oh man. That was the coolest. Our dogs also were freaking out. They did not know what to do. I couldn't believe it, man. I was like, I don't get all weird about that stuff. I was just like, okay, it's going to happen, but we're driving. And then all of a sudden it just got a little darker and I was like, you're doing it while you're driving. No, no, no. We were just like, I knew it was like around two o'clock. And so it was like one 45 Oh, okay. And I'm seeing all the people on the highway at every gas station, every house. There's just people lined up, you know, in chairs or whatever. And I'm like, okay, so it's about to happen soon. And sure enough, it like started getting all dark. And I was like, Brad, we got to stop. We got to <laughs> stop. So we pulled over at this church and there was a bunch of people in there. And, and a couple of them had some extra sunglasses for us or, or whatever. And dude, it was like one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. It was so nuts. I couldn't Kelsey believe it. Like she the was whole... about to cry. I was like, what? She's like, I'm getting so emotional right now. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like why? Yeah. It was, it was crazy. It was, it was like a movie. It was like a movie, man. It was, it was insane. So, so we got here Monday and then right after I went and I played the course, which was funny because I started at all whole one and now all the numbers are mixed up. So I was like playing through like 30 groups without <laughs> even knowing it. Uh, When's the next practice. one? Do we know? Sorry. I, 140 before... years. No, oh, 55 years. I think. For for a total? Oh, I I heard something different. I, I believe you. Like so, I said, I don't so know. So it'd be what, stuff. like 69? 2069? 79. 79? I'm pretty sure. I just looked it up like two days ago. Someone just said 2044, 2045 in the chat. That might be no a lunar knows. eclipse. I don't know. Oh, a different one. Okay. Yeah. There's like three different ones. Okay. All right. Sorry, Yuli. I, I well, had to good. know if you're I was going to still be yeah. alive for another one or if I saw the, the last possible. one in my if life. If it's in 60 years, it's, it's, there's a slim possibility. Slim chance. I guess um, stop eating gluten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so uh, then we, we went out and we got the Joe Mez practice round today. And yeah, just chill, chilling at the Airbnb. So. That was my week. I mean, I got to go home last week, which was awesome. Uh, see my wife. Um, she's she's got her little baby bump going too. Um, that was good to get home and and just hang out with her her and stuff. So I didn't do much. I golfed. I didn't pick up a disc the whole the whole week. Yeah, I just chilled mode. I'm yeah. I'm I'm back in the gym, which uh, 
the doms is setting in. I don't like it, but it is what it is. So I have to deal with it. And then also I watched a lot of basketball. Did anyone catch any of the games? Oh yeah. I watched a ton of, ton of I mean, sports. You won nothing. Dude, I don't watch American sports at all. Zero, literally zero. So, okay. What, yeah. What sporting event would you tune into to watch? All I watch is darts and a snooker. Sometimes I watch okay. them into pool tournaments. Pool isn't really covered that much. I was just um, saying, you have to and watch out Bundesliga. online. German Wait, what was Bundesliga. the last thing? German Bundesliga. That's the German soccer league. Oh. Yeah. Do they have Do they have some pretty good players that play on their national team or no? Do those all play well, in like the Premier League? Ten and years stuff? ago. Wait, was it twenty? No, two thousand ten. I think Germany won the World Cup. Or was it 2006? No, no, no. I, I'm it was. My dates messed up. It was when I, I was there. They won it in Brazil. I was at that one. <laughs> That's Did they I not win Brazil it in that year? Seven one. Yeah, didn't they win it that year? They did. That had to have been like 2014. I think I was 10. It might have been 14. Wait, 10's Ten, too early. I I'm wouldn't have been mixed up in my head now because. Germany lost a final 2014, 2014. It was in Brazil. Yes. I was there and people were like, people, it was, it was terrifying walking on the streets because that was the game that they were crushing Brazil. And I thought I was going to die because people yeah. were so, so nuts in Brazil. It was, it was wild. It, and Germany was the exact opposite. It was, I was in Germany <laughs> watching the game. It was we did not know what the hell was going on. Everyone was just like that giving was away everything for free. Like everything's free. Drinks free. Like, I think all of Germany was on the streets just celebrating. It was like that's stuff like that doesn't happen in soccer. It was they had it was like five zero in thirty that stuff, minutes. It was that stuff insane. doesn't happen in in the states, man. No, like cities. You know, some cities like where the stadium Small is towns. gets crazy. Yeah, but. I, I had a similar experience. I was um, flying to Europe for something and I had a layover in Paris when they were in the um, finals. Oh, and so I had like a 24 hour layover or something. That Mbappe was he on the French team? Mm, I, yeah. Yes, I think so. And okay. that was the one of the craziest experiences of my life. Like going every single downtown Paris, every single little pub had 70 people crowded around one TV. Yeah. Like you couldn't find any. And then when they won, the place was for <laughs> the whole entire night, people were just on their horns in their cars the whole night. It was, it was, I've never experienced anything like that. Never will. Unless I go back to a European country <laughs> while they're in their world cup. Yeah. World cup. I mean, people talk about how big the Super Bowl here is. It doesn't even oh, taste. It's not even it's doesn't not even, even get close. close to the World Cup. Um, but yeah, March Madness went down. UConn ended up winning again, <laughs> and then you also had Caitlin Clark, who, yeah, I think that just kind of shows you. Obviously, women basketball is much bigger than disc golf, but I think that also shows you how certain players can really drive a sport, because yeah. that was the first time that I tuned into women's college basketball same well south carolina has been good for the last couple of years so i've too but i wasn't like making i wasn't like making my plans around like having to sit down and watch i watched the yeah. elite eight game i watched the final four game and i watched the champion i watched three women's basketball games it's nuts yeah. crazy it was really good all right before we get into more action uh got a quick ad read from our sponsor today disc box many disc golfers have tons of extra discs cluttering up our closets and cars there are very few storage products on the market that are designed specifically for golf discs and that and that don't waste any space and unfortunately the ones that do exist are terribly expensive thankfully there's disc box disc box is the only is the only low cost disc golf storage product on the market it's a simple disc golf storage bin that holds up to 30 discs requiring no tape or glue and is made recycled material in the USA. Go to discboxdg.com and you will find quantity discounts, wholesale options, multiple colors, and most importantly, no order minimums. So you can order just a single box if you want. Discbox also makes a great players pack item. Visit discbox.dg.com today and get your collection organized. Use foundation for 15% off your order. There you have it. Um, all right. 
Simon, let's jump into it. I've got some questions to ask you. First one being like, how, how has, you know, season two, I guess, being on tour now with being a father, how, has it gotten easier? Is it harder to get away from home now? I think it's getting harder, especially with a pregnant wife. You just want to like be home and support and help as much as you can. Um, Cause dealing with a toddler, not being pregnant is hard enough, but I think being a, a 30, 35 pounds heavier than you used to and having all these hormonal changes, like, it is not, I don't know. It's just not easy. And also he's getting more and more aware of when I'm leaving and what it means oh. when I pack my bags. And it's always just kind of heartbreaking to like, just watch him, <laughs> watch him at the door when he's crying, when I'm going and you're just like, Oh, it's so, it's such a bummer. Like and every time I just leave the house now, like he doesn't really understand how long I'm gone for. Cause he doesn't speak English yet very well. He's only two years old. But yeah, every time I leave, it's just a heartbreak for him because he doesn't know if I'm going to come back in an hour or in two weeks. Like, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's not oh. easy. And it's definitely getting harder the more aware he gets of what's going on. Are you teaching him German as well? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of <clears throat> struggling with that because the problem we have is that my wife is Puerto Rican. So she is fluent in Spanish and English. I am German, so I'm fluent in German and English. And I don't speak Spanish, and my wife doesn't speak German. So if she teaches my son Spanish, then I don't understand when she speaks Spanish to him or he tries speaking Spanish to me. And if I teach him German, then she doesn't understand what he's trying to say. And I don't oh. know if that's an ideal situation for parenting. That's already pretty difficult, especially with one parent traveling so much. Um, so I'm not doing as good as a job as I was dreaming of when I thought about this whole process. And it's really not easy. It's, it takes a lot of discipline to talk to your kid in a language that your wife doesn't understand. And it kind of sometimes feels a bit weird. Um, but who knows? I'm, I'll keep trying. I have books in German that I try. I try to put on German, um, little like video clips or something when I can just to like, at least give him something. And who knows, maybe in like a year or two when he can communicate a bit better, he's, he's going to like want to learn. And I have some hopes that yeah. I'll figure it out. And maybe I'll do a better job with my daughter. Who knows? <laughs> but I feel like I failed a bit on the trilingual <laughs> Uh, project that we had kind of tried to do but failed the spanish is more likely to happen than the mm -hmm. german right now because she's um, around him yeah and my wife's mother so my mother-in-law she's uh, uh she like only speaks spanish to him so that's much easier yeah what age because like what age do you does like the human start understanding the difference between languages I don't know if that question makes sense, but like, if you're trying to teach your kid, like this is what a ball is, you know, you hold up the object and you're like ball ball. But then if you held up the ball, the ball and you're like ball, and then I'm gosh, it's been so long. I don't even know how to say ball in Spanish. I thought I did. I thought it would come back to me. Yuli, any help? <laughs> Silas, anyone? I got nothing. It's El, it's seven, I don't even know it. <laughs> El Balancesto is basketball. So is it close to that? Balan? Al Balin, but you know what I'm saying? Like now you're saying. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's just say it was that now you're holding it up and saying that I, to me, that seems like it would confuse a, a really yeah. young adult because you're or a, a really young child versus when you're able to like explain and they can under, understand like, Hey, this is one language. This is another language. I, I don't know. It's, I, I, I don't really have any insight on any of that do you guys have any idea on that how that works i mean i i don't know it's probably the best i could also say because who who actually really knows what's going on in the child's brain <laughs> it's, it's so hard to know <laughs> apparently the younger the kid the more the brain is like a sponge and just wants to take in as much information as possible and obviously the sooner you learn something the easier it is for you to like get it right the first mm -hmm. time and the older you get the harder to learn um, especially with languages. I mean, you try to learn a new language like nowadays in our thirties and we're like, 
giving up after <laughs> the first day or two. Um, so I think it's okay to confuse your kid a bit. And I think it'll be worth it in the long run. It just takes hard work and discipline. It's just something you kind of have to work through. And it might delay those first sentences the kid's trying to say and communicate a little bit. But for the long run, I mean, it might be worth it. Your kid just starts speaking a sentence in three different languages. Like they do, they go from one language to the next to the next all in one sentence. That'd be. I mean, bilingual households do that all the time. At, at home, I spoke, uh, we called it like Denglish, like German, which is Deutsch. Denglish would be our, our home language where we would like speak a German English, just complete mm. mix because my, my dad would mostly speak English to us, us and my mom German. And Spanglish is also yep. a very common phrase in like Spanish households. So it's very normal to just mix and match any any kind of words in any sentence when you're it's, when you're a multicultural it's, family. It's easy to to lose a language too. Like my dad s- spoke fluent Spanish when he was a kid, and now he he doesn't. He can understand a little bit, but if he if he were you to be like, how do you say this? He he'd really struggle with it. Like he's forgot pretty much everything which yeah. is kind of crazy to just forget a language to me. Crazy, crazy to think like if you're fluent, like I'm not super surprised. I haven't taken Spanish since high school. So, and I was never close to being fluent. So that's not crazy. But yeah, if you were like fluent in a language and then all of a sudden you just haven't used it long enough <laughs> yeah. to just forget, that's, that's a wild thing to think about. Yeah. Um, Simon, you got any advice for Yuli being a father? Yeah. Give me, hit me. It's it's really hard to give general advice because every child will be so unbelievably different, especially because you're having a girl and all I have experience with is a boy. And from what I've heard, girls and boys as like infants and toddlers are, are generally speaking, very different to deal with. Um, but I would just say just embrace it. In those moments where you are so sleep deprived, you feel like you're losing your mind it'll put the hardest test to your relationship with your wife ever and just like step back from the situation a bit and just like take it in because it's like the craziest stuff you'll ever experience when you're just like, (laughs) yeah, you, all you do is want to sleep and (laughs) stop worrying about your child. But I mean, it's got to keep going. It's like the never ending chore. The first couple months is just like, it's so eye-opening to like wow this is this is now what i'm doing <laughs> it's it's wild yeah it's kind of like that uh that big topic nature versus nurture right and it's i, I definitely lean more on the side of nur- like you have such a huge impact on how this child's life is going to turn out it's it's really crazy you can really mold them in a whole different direction. So when you start oh, thinking about it, it's kind of wild. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's, it's a, I can't even believe like it. Like having that. something like, that is a hundred percent dependent on you to survive. Yeah. Yeah. The well, good thing is, is like, kind of a bit controversial and there's actually a lot of, um, people out there who say that childs aren't super moldable, of course, yeah. to an extent. And uh, I mean, upbringing is a lot and just a healthy family life is of course really important, but there's a pretty big theory out there that like the main character is not very moldable. It's kind of, you get what you get kind of like when you get a pet. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I'm definitely not in the boat of like, it's a hundred percent one way or the other, but I am in the boat that you are able to have an impact on a child's life. Right. You oh, can, yeah, you can, yeah, you can lean them in a direction of hobbies, certain things they might like because they see you do it and they see you enjoy. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can go about it, but yeah, I'm hundred percent in the, in the sense of where it's like, if you get raised by terrible parents, it doesn't mean that you're hundred percent going to be a terrible person. Like you can, you can yeah. obviously figure it out yourself, but you know, I, I don't know if I've told this story on here before, but when I worked at a summer camp, I had two kids that weren't, were would not go into the pool when we had pool time because their mom told them that they would burn alive if they went into the water. And they a hundred percent believed that to the point where they were terrified of it. One of the counselors actually at one point, like picked it, picked one of them up to like put him in the water to show him that it was fine. 
and the kid just went ballistic as soon as he was like walking him towards the water. So now I'm not going to not good count. Good, good <laughs> camp. That was a terrible move on that person's <laughs> part. Push him, push <laughs> him trying to walk by. See, it's fine. Um, it's but fine, I'm not, dude. I'm not that crazy. Like Hunter's crazy. Hunter believes that he can train his kid to believe a carrot is a treat. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I go that far down. I think, <laughs> I think the kid's going to show up to school and he's going to pull out a carrot and be like, or he's going to finish his whole meal and be like, yeah. And like take a <laughs> bite and some kid's going to have fun dip across from him. And some kid's going to have an oatmeal cream pie and some kid's going to have an ice cream sandwich. And he's going to be like, wait a second. <laughs> what, are, what are those? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's, it's, it's also really cool to see how many, you know, we have two women right now that are touring that are both pregnant. It, mm-hmm. I, it seems like right now there's so many people on tour that are, you know, have kids or even are about to have kids. Crazy time. We're all growing up yeah. together. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, next thing I want to say, congrats on 200,000 subscribers. I think, I don't believe last time you were on the cha- uh, on tour life, the pod, you had 200. That was kind of in the last, no, no, no. that was kind of yeah, in the last couple ago, months. Or... Yeah. La- yeah. Just right month. after Austin. Uh, after Waco, right after Waco, Monday after Waco. Yeah. So congratulations. That's a huge milestone. I mean, you're 50,000 away from a quarter of a million, which is absolutely insane. Um, do you want to kind of go down memory lane a little bit and just kind of tell, you know, the listeners that like how the journey has gone? Well, um, I can just say the basics. I don't know how many times I've talked about this in podcasts, maybe never, maybe a couple times, but I started YouTube with no goal of making money with it or building a hundred thousand plus member audience. And I think that is one of the main reasons I, first of all, still enjoy it. And, uh, it happened to be so successful. The only reason I did YouTube was because I wanted to do it. And, and I think that is the best motivation for anything is just like, I didn't have to ever make myself, I have to go make a video. I mean, vlogmas sometimes became questionable, um, when you feel like you're putting yourself in a position where you kind of have to do something that you not necessarily want to do every day. But um, YouTube has always been something that I very much enjoyed and wanted to do. And it was never about growing or making money with it at all. It was just about, this is what I want to do. And it just happened to be successful. But I think I would, I mean, I don't know if I'm just saying that, but it feels like I would also still be doing it if it was not successful. Mm. Like I just do it because I like it. Mm. So it's that's definitely my, easier. Uh, it, it definitely is easier because it's successful, but you're saying you would oh, still yeah. have the same well, passion to go out and film a video. What's the comparison Brody? When you, when you first started YouTube, what ours were your is, goals? Ours is very similar because when I first started YouTube, you actually couldn't make money. So I was back in the, in the, like right now, anyone that starts YouTube channel, you, uh, it's kind of changed over the years, but right now it's like a thousand subscribers and then like 4,000 watch time, I think. And then from there, every video you upload, you can start making money back when I did it. They, they actually reached out to you and um, they would say, oh, wow. Hey, this video that you just posted or that you posted a week ago or whatever is starting to get a lot of views. We want to monetize it. So it was like on a per video basis. It was very strange. And so I made dozens and dozens and dozens of tutorial videos and all this stuff and wasn't making any money. Um, and my whole thing was, I was kind of going about the route. I did enjoy doing it, but I was also one of the first people to do ultimate Frisbee content. So I was actually trying to get more people interested in, in ultimate. And also I went on and if you just search like how to throw a Frisbee, it was videos from like five, 10 years ago, like really far in the past. And they were terrible. They were giving terrible advice. They're doing all sorts of things that I would never tell anyone to do. So I was like, Hey, like with anything, if you're good at it 
if you can figure it out, it's actually a lot more enjoyable than not being good at it. So I was like, let me start making videos. So that's how I started. Um, but Simon, what gave you, what gave you like the push to start doing YouTube? What, like at what point were you like, oh, Hey, I, I want to make my first YouTube video. I've always been in, into content creating even before content creating was even a thing. So like when I was a young kid, one of my early, early Christmases that I remember, all I wanted for Christmas was like a little camcorder, mm. like back in the day where you had this little tape cassette that you put in that like actually like played the film on it. It's like the home alone, um, uh, the home alone video camera camcorder, I think. Right. Yeah. Some, some, like just old school stuff from like yeah. the late 1990s or early 2000s. Um, and I would make videos with my brothers or I would go to the skate park and make a little skate video. There was nowhere to post it or share it with anyone. I would just do it for myself and have my parents watch it or my friends. Um, so I was like into that kind of stuff. I joined a lot of music classes as well and did some music editing. So just like this whole being creative with music or video or even putting both together was just always a big part of my life. And then I've been a sucker for YouTube basically ever since the platform came out. I follow a lot of bigger YouTubers and I don't know, it was always something where I thought, man, maybe I could do this. Do you was uh, there like, oh, ahead, was really. there like motivation from anybody who was doing content in disc golf that you looked at and, were, and you were like, okay, I could, I could do that as well. Or, or did you consume any disc golf content at the time when you were like, oh no, I enjoy this. I want to do it. I'm trying to think like I started back in 2018, my YouTube channel, and I was doing like disc golf style vlogs where I would throw in trick shots here and there, but mainly just go play courses, do like little course reviews, do like some tutorials, have like some friends, local people just be guests on the channel. I would, I don't really remember seeing many people do that back then. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to say I started that thing. Cause I don't think I did. I'm sure there were people who did it before me and maybe my saw people do it. Uh, I just don't remember right now. This yeah. probably wasn't like very wasn't mainstream much. either of where it's like no. getting passed around the whole disc golf community where everyone knew about, Oh, this YouTube channel. It was like Terry Miller, right? He was, he was the one doing a lot of the coverage. Mm. Yeah. Um, was Joe Mez he around video, then? He had a, he had a video blog blog as well, so he'd do like little vlogs here and there. Okay, was Joe jo Mez wasn't around back then, right? They started later. Oh, they were. Well, they were doing just coverage, coverage. round coverage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there wasn't there wasn't probably any big like creator that was making content back then on like a consistent basis. Were you making like vlogs? Be uh, this is a silly question, but I don't remember the first vlogs that I ever saw about disc golf were actually Eagles vlogs. Was yep. he after you? Oh gosh. My brain is so <laughs> melted right now that I don't even remember Eagles. vlogs. of course Eagle was, uh, but I think Eagle kind of pioneered the disc golf vlog thing, oh. at least on the pro tour. I mean, even pre pro tour, he would do phone vlogs. He would do like tournament yeah. weekends. And I think, I think he started that around 2016. I could be off by a year, but I was also doing, if you go to my YouTube channel and scroll all the way to the first videos, I have, I have a couple of videos like 2015, 2016, like before I actually took it seriously. Um, so it was also something that I was into early. I think 2014 is my very first video. Um, Do you know what the title, was, the title of that video? It might be... I was doing like a promo for the MD2, which was, was like a 10, new... It was, it was 10 years ago. Oh, you're looking at it right now? No, I already had it. That was going to be a question I was going to ask you. Oh, I'm you, not 100% you... sure what's the first one. I think it might be my MD2 promo. Yes, Dismania C-Line MD2 promo. That's actually a really good video. <laughs> <laughs> <You're>, that's... <laughs> Hey, that's something that's impressive. Saying your first video is really good. I don't know what my first video was, but I bet it was complete trash. It takes. I mean, a, if you most... watch that video, uh, it's terrible. I mean, you look, you can, you can see it's made on iMovie <laughs> with all the tacky, weird little uh, transitions <laughs> and the weird music effects. Like, it's not good. But you can already like even ten years ago, you can like pinpoint my style that I was already like kind of like mm -hmm. 
binding then, which was like just kind of like trying to throw aces and doing making really hard things look casual. I, I I always was like a big fan of that style. Like I would never like Brody, your style was to like make something really cool and then like celebrate like crazy. Mm-hmm. My style was more the do something cool and act like it's normal. Yeah, I went what you said was the exact opposite. Those are my least favorite trick shots is doing something that's really hard and make that looks easy. There was a, a good example would be um there was like a uh, a mailbox thing that people would like, you know, throw their mail into and it was a slit that was like maybe just a little bit bigger than a frisbee. So it was 100% feasible. The problem was for for a frisbee to go in that you had to be somewhat close to it and being, you know, 20 feet away and throwing it into that slit is not very easy at, at all at all. It's very, very difficult. The problem is if you do it though, it doesn't really look that hard. And so I was yeah. always trying to do stuff that I can consistently do but other people would look at it and be like, holy cow, how did he do that? When in fact, it wasn't that hard that I did. It just, like you said, I just did something that kind of looked cool. Um, so we, we went about different ways. One thing I actually do really respect from you too, is you always kept the editing. And I don't know if that's still the case now, cause you're, you might be a little bit busier being a father, but you, for the longest times, like you were still editing your videos. And I think a lot of times YouTubers try to grow really fast so they can start passing that along to someone else. And then you can kind of see a change in their videos because you're, you do kind of the vlog style. And I think with that, you can really tell when another editor kind of touches it because you're not able to be like, Oh, this, I said this, this, I want to put an emphasis on this. Um, Do you still edit your stuff now? Every single time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to do. Um, it definitely is tough to do. Uh, another question I, I had, it. I would never give that away. Yeah. You some know, people, I hate that's, editing. That's crazy. Cause when I started mine, I did all mine. And then I ha- I had a guy who then did them after that for a couple years. And then now I do all mine again and I like it way more than handing it off. Mm. I can do it quicker, the handoff and then the time frame of doing that. And then that person editing took a long, it was like a longer process. It was like a couple day process. And now Ooh. I can get it done in like 20 Yuli, minutes or something. Yuli, you're an editing ninja. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but I, when I went to vlogmas last year to Yuli's house and he would film a vlog and he would just like go to his little couch <laughs> on his phone for a second. And like two minutes later, he'd be like, okay, done post. <laughs> I was like, what? Like I get like well, locked in like an hour, two hours. I need everything to be just how I want it. And that, usually it's just a bit more straightforward. Yeah. That's something that I don't want to do, which I did on my first ones ever. I would be like, Oh no, that's wrong. And I would get really um, technical with it. And now like, I feel like some, there's going to be some people who definitely see the flaws and they're definitely like, Ooh, this is kind of trash. But for the most part, the people, the consumer, I feel like is just trying to see what, what, like what's going on. This is what I want to watch. Let me see it and get on to more content. You know, let me consume some more stuff. I feel like that would be the most or the more majority. And that's what I try to think because I do know that, like he said, I get through it really quick. I don't add any extra little things. I'm just like clip, 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 pull them together and send it on its way type thing but that's also a style. You know what I mean? Like, um, I've never done like vlogs until this last, this year, I started doing this thing called the Yuli report, which is just me and like AB and and like what my week's like, like, that's all it is. Because I, one thing that I do not like that I can't stand is editing rounds. I just don't like it. Like I don't enjoy editing them. It's quick and I can do it fast, but the process of filming it, editing it and then shipping it out there, even though people love it, I can't stand it. And so I, I was like, this is why my YouTube channel took a big time hit. Like for a year, I didn't do anything. And it was because that I didn't enjoy it Mm -hmm. and doing these vlogs. I actually enjoy it. You know, like I, because that's what I consume. If I'm watching YouTube, I'm usually consuming more of a vlog style. Anyway, I'm not watching content of somebody playing basketball. I'm watching like a, a podcast or, 
um, a clip of a podcast or I'm watching somebody's life. You know what I mean? And so I completely relate with the fact that you're like, no, I enjoy it. I love it. You got to find that kind of niche of being like, this is what I love to do. Yeah, the the heavy production stuff has really died out over the last 10 years or so on YouTube. It used to be all three to five minute YouTube videos that were highly produced, um, you know, had a great storyline, whatever it was. And those were all the big videos that we all saw. And then now, I mean, if I would have gone back and when I first started YouTube and being like, hey, I'm going to do a, a, a video on YouTube where I just go live and I just talk for over an hour, people would be like, that's, that's, that's going to be terrible. No one's going to watch that. And now, like what you said, Yuli, like that's what tons of people, you know, turn on yeah. podcasts now. Pod, I, podcasts were just not very popular when I was, I don't know about you guys, were you guys listening to podcasts in high school and no, college? Ne- never. never. I never consumed content like that. Like I was always a live, like sports or move a movie. I never, I didn't know about YouTube until disc golf and until like i had to work in that like jomez i never watched any any of that stuff it's crazy how fast times can change um all right simon what next question for you what is your most watched youtube video easy answer scott stokely um it's titled playing disc golf with a true legend i think (laughs) And that after that correct. video got so successful, if you if you scroll down, like right after that, I tried to name a lot of other videos a similar <laughs> title, like with playing disc golf up first and then blah, blah, blah. Because um, I thought maybe that's the algorithm that everyone talks <laughs> about, like the right <laughs> thumbnail and the perfect title. Yeah, like if you just yeah. get it right, that's... Um, yeah, that video performed like way out of whack for what my videos usually do, obviously. That, that video has over a million views. And I talked to Scott wow. Stokely actually about it. And he was like, yeah, do you know why? And I was like, yeah, I got lucky with the algorithm, of course. He was like, no, it's because I'm in it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> nice. yeah YouTube, I, w- I wish I could like understand the algorithm. I-, I think there's a lot of people that spend way too much time on that. And I think, you know, what you and Yuli have been saying where it's just like, I'm going to go out, I'm going to make content that I love. I'm going to post it. If it does well, great if it doesn't i still had a good time i think that's how you should really attack it Uh, unless you're trying to do it on a business obviously if you try and do it on a business sure have a full team try to figure out all the algorithm stuff but like bro i I, at the end of the day it's like some of the stupidest videos you post all of a sudden just has crazy views and you're like "Uh, well how and it's like it just it got put on something and people clicked no one really understands it, or at least I've I never, don't. I've <laughs> never had any video in YouTube or a reel go viral. Never one time <laughs> ever, bro. It's so well, YouTube's like, a lot harder now. YouTube's a yeah, lot harder now. Yeah, or like, but the reels are the ones that get me because I'll see like, you know, I'll look at like Adam's deal and it'll be like, yeah, on this one, I don't know what happened, but I got like 4 million views and I'm like, my my most viewed reel is like a hundred thousand and like multiple people like a b's ace at at winthrop on hole seven mm-hmm. that got 35 million views or something mm-hmm. crazy and i'm like how are these people doing it like i've posted so many clips so many reels so many aces so many this so many that and none of them get like none of them go viral i'm waiting for my viral moment i'm waiting <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, Do you ever have it where you, yeah, where you post a video and you kind of don't feel great about the video? You think it's fine, it's not your favorite video, it's okay, and posting something is better than posting nothing. So you throw it out there, you're not happy with it, you think the video kind of sucks, but you still post it. And then, like, years later, I will go back and, like, rewatch that video. I have lots of videos that I thought were not very good when back when I posted them, and then two years later, I watched them again. And I think, wow, that was actually not that bad as I remember it. I remember this video being terrible. And then I rewatch it. I'm like, that's kind of watchable. So I kind of like going back sometimes to like remind Hmm. myself that even when you feel like sometimes you're not doing like the best job, you're not super happy with it. It's probably not as bad as it feels. It might be the exact opposite. I think, I think a lot of my stuff is like Ninja Turtles where 
I watched Ninja Turtles as a kid. I'm like, this is the sickest movie ever. These guys, <laughs> these guys are awesome. And then I watch it now and I'm like, bro, what is this? Like, it, it's like they, they clearly are in suits. They don't look realistic. Like the fighting scenes are awful. I think that's more my, like what if, if I go back and watch some of the videos that at the time I posted, I was like, this is the sickest thing to ever hit the internet. I'd probably watch it now and be like, eh, this is, this is kind of meh. Uh, I have a hard time watching me in anything. <laughs> like that's what I have a hard time yeah, doing. I don't watch, like going, I, I don't watch going, myself. Watching myself. I'm like, dude, you're a total dweeb, bro. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't watch myself or hear yourself talk. That's the funniest thing. Like some of those, uh, some of those reels are going around where it's like, he's like talking about any, what he thinks he sounds like. And then he, he records it and listens to it back. And it's like, meep, 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 meep. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've spent far too much time looking at myself and listening to myself talk to where now it's, uh, it's nice that we have Silas, we have Connor, we have a good editing team to where now I can just show up, make the content. And then I don't ever have to pay attention Watch to it. it Cause it's like, it's like, too much, man. I don't know how you guys do it. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're over it too. I don't know. Um, next thing here, we're just just the right amount of narcissistic. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. About, yeah. yeah I yeah. guess. I guess so. Um, all right, let's let's talk a little disc golf. It's it, we went down memory lane on YouTube. Let's talk a little. Disc- Wait, one, oh, one, yeah, go, Yuli. One more question yeah. for what's your favorite? What's your favorite one that you ever made? Like your absolute favorite that you had, maybe you had a blast doing it and let's say it doesn't have the most views, but what was the one where you're like, man, that, that was a fun time. I'm glad I did that. Well, probably cause you're asking right now, the first videos that come to mind is our pool videos. They were <laughs> first of all, so fun to make. I mean, the commentary, yeah. I wish we had like the behind the scenes footage of us doing the commentary. Cause we are such idiots. Just like talking such crap into did the you guys microphone. Do post and commentary. Canned. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we're right. commentating about us in like third person. It's absolutely stupid and ridiculous. <laughs> it is so freaking cringe, but it kind of worked. I think kind of we hit kind of a sweet spot of just being yeah. cringe enough to not be too bad. Um, so even though those videos don't perform very well, I think they're some of my lowest watch videos because it's pool content on my disc golf channel. Obviously yeah. disc golf fans don't want to watch pool. Um, but I think I had the most fun. Obviously, I love playing pool. So playing and editing and doing the voiceovers on those videos was so much fun. But what do I think is my best? What one of the uh, ever things made? that people won't know about, like the last one that we made, is there was a point where it took us thirty minutes to get three sentences in because I just kept <laughs> laughing so hard at what we were trying to say. Yeah. That was ridiculous. I was getting actually angry at you because you just couldn't <laughs> say could that one. You were so convinced that your line was so funny that you had to say it and you couldn't say it for like 20 days. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't even that funny. No, not at all. Um, uh, I think this is probably not the right answer, but I'm really bad at answering like questions I didn't prepare for. And I don't, I, I probably, when I rethink this later in bed, I'll be like, why did you answer this? But I made like a, a glitch promo when I made that German uh, glitch video with power grip last year. And the promo video I made for that disc, I was pretty stoked with because I found a really good track, like good music for it. And it just lined up perfectly. And, I got to be creative with some editing stuff and I was pretty proud of that video on how it turned out. Um, probably not the right answer, but that just pops to mind right now. Yeah. I do have want you... to tell one more story though, not yeah. YouTube related, but do you have anything else or should uh, I go? Oh, I have, I have tons of stuff, but you can go. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Before we dive into the disc golf real quick. So on Instagram, the Disc Golf Pro Tour channel, they have this little bit where they ask some of the pros, what was your most embarrassing disc golf moment? I, you I watched yours maybe? and I was going to bring yeah. it up and then I thought your answer was terrible, so I was not going to bring it up. Okay, yeah. I agree my answer was terrible. That was one of those situations where <laughs> if you're not I was embarrassed, like put on the like, spot. You don't have a good answer. 
Well, I thought of something now. Oh, that oh. kind of <laughs> made me feel very embarrassed. Yuli, did you watch this, so, by the way? Oh, yeah, I saw it. I saw okay, it. Okay. Well, tell people your first answer in case they didn't see the clip. So nothing came to mind. So I just kind of like bl- blabbered whatever the first thing came to mind that wasn't really, really embarrassing. So I threw on throw down the mountain at the tournament in competition on hole 18. I drove the green. The final round of like 2019 throw down the mountain. Probably one of the gnarly. greatest tournament gnarly. shots ever. Like probably a top I, 10 tournament shot. I heard that Garrett Gerthy has done it, not in competition, but he has pulled off that shot in like a practice round or casual round, whatever. Um, but I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only one to do it in competition, which it's an, an insane shot if you see that shot. And then I missed like a 20, 25 footer for Eagle. And there was like a big crowd around the basket and I just like melted to the ground. <laughs> Not a great story. That's the only thing that came to mind back then. But now I remember that I don't remember the year. It must have been 2016 or 17 or something. Maybe 18. Maybe 18. I think it might be 18. I was in Finland. You know, biggest disc golf nation in the world. Um, I was with UC in his hometown. And you know, if you know UC at all, he loves to promote. He loves to hype anything up as much as possible. So I was doing my Finland tour where I was doing clinics and I would do a lot of meet and greets. And Finland disc golf is so big in Finland that actual sports stores have disc golf sections. Like every, like compared to Dick's Sporting Goods, every Dick's Sporting Goods in Finland has a disc golf section also, but like a legit one because disc golf is such a big deal. So I would do meet and greets in those major sporting goods stores i think i had like six or seven lined up for my entire tour in different in different cities in finland so we're doing the first one my first ever meet and greet in an actual store in a mall and i'm of course a bit nervous this might be my first meet and greet really i've ever done um we get to the store there's like a big sign in the front of the store like simon lazad this time this date and we walk in and there's zero people <laughs> there for me. Like not only were there zero people there for me, there were zero people <laughs> in the entire store, <laughs> even shopping for anything. So we walked in, me and Yizzy, I was like looking around and one of the <laughs> one of the people who worked there just came up to us and we like just looked around and we were just all standing there um like kind of like shrugging our shoulders and being like well and i just felt so bad about myself i was like wow <laughs> oh i thought i'm like kind of like a celebrity in finland like a disc golf celebrity <laughs> And they had More big signs man. up. And More I, marketing. And I walked in that store and just to see it just like completely dead and not, not one person, zero. <laughs> I was just like, oh, that changed. That changed my life kind of. Like <laughs> I haven't enjoyed any meet and greet uh, in my life. Pee Wee, one of our tour life crew members, when he has posted, did they try and sell you a disc? <laughs> yeah, Someone they, come over they, and ask you, hey, do you uh, you looking for a disc over here, Simon? Oh, um, I, hey, I at least just you walked to the disc racks and started going through the discs, <laughs> acting like I was doing something, and I was obviously, I was just, I wanted to dig a hole and just go into the hole. At least that you weren't. Uh, at least you didn't go in like guns blazing. There's a there's a video clip of, I believe his name is Banks and Phase Phase Banks. That's what it was. I was blanking on what it was. Phase Banks, and they're like a big gaming company where they stream a bunch of video him. games. Okay, so there's yeah. a, there's a, there's a clip of him like with all his butt boys, and they're filming it, and like he's going into GameStop in a mall. And he's assuming everyone's going to know who he is and freak out. And so he goes in there. He's like filming himself. He's like, what's up, everyone? Banks is in the house. And like everyone's just like, bro, what? Get get out of here. <laughs> and then he's just like, and you see him like walk out. Like at least you didn't do that. That could have been way. You like open the door. What's up? Simon's here. And you're just like. Uh, <laughs> I think I might have saved it. 
<laughs> I think if I would have like pulled it off like that, it would have been at least funny. Funny, and not yeah. just kind of sad, just standing there <laughs> wanting to die. <laughs> oh man! All right, uh, well, and then I had to do six more meet and greets at those stores, and they all went a bit better. Thank God. That's good. Jeez, gosh, that's terrifying. Um, all right, let's uh, let's talk a little disc golf here. Uh, how how's the season going so far for you? We're through four events. Leaning into Jonesboro here. Uh, how's it going? Um, <laughs> it's going pretty crappy. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm playing fine. Just slight little mistakes here and there. Kind of sometimes feeling like taking shots for granted that I shouldn't. Kind of like sometimes I feel like I'm throwing like amateur shots out there. I'm playing mm. decent. And then just out of nowhere, I like catch myself off guard somehow. I make such a stupid mistake and it like throws me off for the rest of the round. Cause I'm like, so in my head, like, how did I just make that mistake? Just like, I blow my own mind by so- sometimes by how bad I'm throwing. But, um, yeah, um, I'm Waco was extraordinarily bad, but besides that, it's just been meh. Like, I think meh is the best word to describe my season so far. Like, Hovering around 20th place, I mean, it's okay, I guess, but meh would describe it better. Just, I can't finish around, it feels like right now. I often start hot and then kind of fall asleep halfway through. And, dude, nowadays, what what's really different this year than any year before, and this is so true, that if you play a meh first round... Let's say you shoot like a four or five under, which is like 1030 rated, 1035 rated. It's fine, not bad. And you look on the, you, you feel like okay about yourself. And after the round, you check scores and you're in like 60th place or 50th place. And you're just like, <laughs> I need to get used to that feeling because that has not been how disc golf worked at all in the last 10 years that I've been on tour. And it's, it's so hard to try to come back from 50th 60th place looking at the list of who's all in front of you and who you now have to catch up to all these guys that are freaking geniuses um and i think that's what i've most been struggling with is finding myself after round one in like 40th to 60th place and trying to find the motivation or even the belief to come back from that anywhere near the top 10 i think i'm lacking a bit of confidence after a slow start and a bit of belief just to like, man, these guys are so good. They don't make mistakes. Like, what? <laughs> it's something I got to get used to. What? One of the things about that is, like, even, like, five years ago, let's say you're in 60th place. You know if you just play a halfway decent round, for sure 20th. And if you play, like, a hot round, you could drop jump into the top 10 easy. So there was this, like, extra motivation to go out there. And now if you shoot, let's say you shoot like a 10, whatever the course record is, uh, I guess ratings is the best way to describe it. Let's say you shoot like a 1060 round that's jumping you into from 50th to like 31st. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. Like, it's crazy. Like you're like, wow, I really did it today. Like I definitely jumped up and you look at the scores and you're like, I barely jumped up. And then to top that off, you could be in, in, 50th and 20th is three strokes ahead of you. So you have like three, four bad holes and all of a sudden you're, you drop 20 places like Mm -hmm. easily, like one mistake is magnified. So, um, so much. Do you, uh, do either of you guys have any goals for this season? I have a couple. Yeah. I'm in any goals. My main goal I mean, I'm going to be a dad again in two weeks. Um, so it's, I don't know. My season's going to be cut in half a bit. I'll take, I'm after Jonesboro and Nashville, I'm taking two months off to stay home with family and help as much as I can. And then who knows? I mean, with newborns, you never really know uh, what's going to happen. So the Europe plans are still a bit of a question mark. And I really want to go to European open in Estonia if I can, but I can't really plan that until like probably a couple of weeks before those tournaments happen. Just seeing how the how the newborn is doing. Um, but 
I don't know. With all the injuries I've gone through through my life, with all the mental battles I've had on this on these courses, my main goal is kind of just play every tournament, survive injury free, event. <laughs> injury free, and with a smile on my face. And the injury free is sadly the easier part. It feels like right now than the smile on my face because, man, sometimes it's. After all these years, I still get in my head and feel myself getting so frustrated. Like I, I talk out my putter in Houston <laughs> last week in Houston. I tackled my putter on hole sixteen. I haven't tackled many discs in my no. life, but that was like my my third taco ever. Um, I gave like my whole bag away after the first event. <laughs> I've done that multiple times. <laughs> I was like, I don't need these. You take them. <laughs> take all these, please. Oh, at least, at least seeing someone else thing. excited, it, it made it made it a little bit better. Um, you, you have any goals you want to share? Um, let's see. Like, what's one? Well, one of the goals that I had going into this year is a funny one. Like, I wanted to be the most improved player from last year because I. Wait, got didn't beat you out win that Proc- last year? No, I got beat out by Proctor. So I was like, no, I want to win that this year. So that was one of my goals. But then, like Simon said, w- there's a, there's a big there's a big <laughs> spot in that <laughs> asterisk in there because Sarah's uh, due in August, and that's when all the playoff events are, and Worlds, and y- you know what I mean um, in that stretch. So I I don't think that that's like a feasible goal probably anymore. Um, but I just don't want to, one of my main goals is I want to learn how to, I want to learn what my golf game is. Like, I just, I feel like I've been so lost the last couple of years that I have, I have no idea who I am as a golfer anymore. Well, I'm starting to learn that. Like I'm, I'm trying to take it as, okay, I'm not that guy anymore. Like you have to you have to lose those thoughts of this is me. This is what I think I am as a player, you know, like your identity, like is one of the things that really helps you. Like we were saying, I'm the guy that I can shoot 1070 final round and make that jump. Um, Those jumps aren't possible anymore. So that thought process changes. And I just want to understand more of what Paul Uliberry golf is. And if I can forget about everybody else, then I can figure out a, the best way to play my best game. And that's probably pretty good. And maybe just maybe when everything goes right, I'll get in contention a few more times rather than putting so much pressure on myself to be the person that was always in contention at one point. That's not a feasible thing, but that's not really a feasible thing for a lot of great players anymore. Like it's just so hard now that there's only probably five, six guys out there that can get in contention every single weekend and week out. And even they have struggles. I mean, Simon's won four times in the last three years, right? Is that four times last six six times in the last three years? And he's having, he's having uh, the beginning of the season where he's talking about, Oh, I'm in 20th and I'm struggling to get up there. And so that was like my biggest struggle the last two years. And I want to get rid of that. I want to figure out, okay, how am I supposed to play to my best ability, whatever those abilities are and forget about everybody else, because that's probably still pretty good. Good. Good point. All right. There's a question from Crylock. They asked Simon, I saw an article about how international billiards rules state the eight ball goes on the head string for the break. I've never done or seen that in person. Always the lead ball. Have you ever seen it? no idea what this question is asking so are they saying they're placing the eight ball like on where the dot is supposed or would i think that guy is confused oh Oh, i see what you're saying they just take the whole rack and push it forward because some people play the the first ball goes on the dot and some play where that middle ball which an eight ball is the eight goes on the dot i always play the first where the balls go when you break which way are you supposed to play it? it doesn't there's no right or wrong and turn tournaments actually do it differently too, depending on how they want players to break because balls oh. fly in different directions, depending on where the rack is positioned. Oh, so some, one of the positions is harder to make balls than the other one. So some tournaments play the harder version. I'm not sure which one it is right now. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. That makes sense now. I actually know what he's asking now. I had no, when I wrote this down, I had no idea what this question was, but that makes sense. Odd um, question a bit. Good question. I mean, yeah. It's a little bit out there. All right. I actually want to roll through this. This was an interesting list. I had Edwin stats pull up because we're seeing so many people win, but obviously only a couple people can win in a year, right? There's not that many tournaments. So I was curious. We went back to 2019 and I only wanted to know about disc golf pro tour events and majors or no, sorry, not majors, literally just disc golf pro tour events, not silver series, Elite series, I guess, whatever they're called now. I, they're not called elite series anymore. They're called uh, elite events, I guess. These are some of the guys that are on this list. These are the most events played since 2019 without a win. You have Austin Hannum, 78. Garrett Gerthy, 77. Chris Clemens, 77. Jeremy Colling, 76. Luke Humphrey, 75. AJ Carey, 73. Andrew Presnell and Tristan Tanner at 70, Thomas Gilbert at 69, and Ezra Aderhold at 68. Any surprises on this list? And any people do you think is going to get their first win this year that are on this list? Simon's fact checking. Garrett Gerthy. Silver event. Garrett Gerthy won 2019 Masters Cup. That was a silver event? Oh, that's NT. We weren't counting NTs either. Just disc golf oh, pro okay. tour. Cause I think down the road, Simon, I think down the road, people are just going to be like, they won this many disc golf pro tour events, right? Like yeah, you yeah, won yeah, six yeah. disc golf pro tour events in the last two years. We, it starts getting confusing when you start. So there's just disc golf pro tour events. Anyone on this list that you think From is like 2000, is next 2018, you said 19. After 2019. So this is this is the COVID year, 2020 moving forward. So, can uh, we see the that, list again? Yeah, can you put that list again, Silas? Um, the one that well, jumps out to me Ezra's, is Ezra. Yeah, that's the one yeah, that jumps Ezra's out. Ezra's performance last week was very um, promising, of course. Kind Luke of out of nowhere, Humphrey. right? He kind of had a slow season too and then just popped off in Houston. Luke Humphreys um, also almost won. That's kind of crazy. Two people on this list literally almost won already this year. Yeah, Luke might have one in him. I mean, Garrett Gerthy, really. He Yeah, surprise he hasn't. I feel like he jumps out to me most out of these guys who really deserve. Do you think Clemens has a chance? Certain courses, maybe? Certain courses, definitely. Um, would be just cool. Having, I don't think many lefties have won pro tour events. I also just don't really remember Clemens like being in the thick of it late in a tournament. So it'd be, it would kind no, of he, be like, it'd kind of be like a Parker well, he's working Welch on a new bag. Right? He's working on a new bag. So we'll give he, him he, half a he season. Almost, he almost won the USCGC. Like uh, every season, it seems like he's, he has stretches where he plays great golf and he's like on lead cards. It seems like. To me, though, it always seems like he's he finishes. He has really good finishes, but he I've never thought like coming down to the last four holes. I've never thought, oh, he has a chance to win. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but it always seems like he's like top 20, top 15, top 10. It'd be really interesting to see him in. He's the lead with four holes to go. How how does he handle it? Because I was shocked to see how Parker, how well Parker Welk did. Right. Like. Well, that's, Parker was a one-off. Like that's a dream situation right there. That is that won't happen many times in a sport where you've never been in contention before, and you just handle it like that, and you just freaking beat the best player in the world <laughs> and make it look easy. Like that was that was unbelievable. Like I couldn't yeah. believe what I was watching. I think most people, people couldn't. People don't talk about that much. All right, size. Don't put this list up. We're gonna see how many you guys can get off of this list. So this is. The top, uh, or sorry, the, there's only 25 players that have won on have won either an elite or major event since 2019. Can you name them? 25 people since 2019. Wow. Well, Let's get our fingers Simon. out, Yuli. Yeah. yeah. Simon. Simon's one. We'll go Macbeth. We'll get the big guys That's out of two. the way. Uh, we'll go yep. Ricky. We'll go Anthony. Yep. 
Eagle. We'll go Kyle Klein. Eagle. Yeah. Eagle. You're still missing a big one. Calvin. We'll go Gannon. Calvin. Gannon. Yep. You still have a couple in the top 10 that you're missing. Did you say Adam? Nope. No, not Adam. Yet. You, got, you got Adam now. Yep. He had two. Drew Gibson. Drew Gibson had two. Still missing um, two with four. Matteo. Matteo has one. Um, Maybe. Remember, it's elite and majors. Freeze. Elite and majors. Oh, majors. Kyle Klein. You're missing a couple major champions. Yes, you got Kyle from last year. <laughs> he won. He won a couple of them last year. <laughs> oh, Isaac Robinson. There you go, Isaac. Did we say that? Okay. Got Isaac. And then you're missing another guy that has four, and then the rest have two and one. The other four is a big name. Some are probably <laughs> poking guy. Yuli as like. He should know this person. <laughs> he should. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drawing such a blank on all, all these. If I had a list, Wait, I could James look Conrad. at James, James Conrad. Conrad. He has two. James Conrad. Yep. Nice. Oh, Corey someone, Ellis. Someone has four. Corey Ellis. Yep. Yeah. And it's, he has four. He's kind of been under the radar lately. Uh, also, just for Are you guys to throw guy more info. Throw more information at you. Double G, he has three second place finishes and three third place finishes since 2019. So six wow. times he's been super mm. close. Um, there's actually two people that, well, one of them is 100% Yuli should get. What? Yeah, Yuli, start thinking, but. <laughs> <laughs> why me? Uh, why likes, are likes, likes to wear likes to wear camo. Oh, Chris, oh, Dickerson. Dick, Dickerson has four. Yeah. He now you have a bunch. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Jones. Kevin Jones has two. Now you have a bunch of twos and yep. ones left. Bunch of twos and ones. You guys didn't list the one that we were just talking about. Oh, Parker. Parker Welk. <laughs> Oh gosh, I already forgot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh no! Um, insane, How many do we have left? In, in, you have like seven. We left. said like thirty names already. No, no, you okay. have seven left. Insane one at Waco. Oh, uh, Col Colton. Uh, Colton's on there. Oh. Yep, but another insane one yeah. at Waco. Massive putt on hole Nico. seventeen. Nico. Nico. Nico there you go. Oh, two. Brad, Bradley. Am yep. Nico yeah. has two. Bradley's on there. Yep. Uh, this guy, I have Bradley. no idea where this guy won. I did not know he had a win. Um, Ooh. but uh, probably the the loudest person on tour besides me. <laughs> will scream and say hello to you across two holes. Has has a disc golf no. company in his family. Um, uh, started running and lost a lot of weight. Man, uh, ha has a Twitch has a Twitch gaming channel. This is all the same person, by the way. This is all the same person. You gave me so much information. I had somebody in my brain, and I lost them because of you. <laughs> Literally, I had like one of the wife, winners. In my wife brain. used to tour, doesn't tour anymore. Wait. Sunglass company. What are you talking about right now? <laughs> so many good hints. I can't give you any more hints. These are the best That's hints too many ever. Hints already. Sunglass company with the white. Everyone used to wear them. They thought they were so cool. They had white borders. Oh man, you've got. Oh, you're wearing the. Whale sack. You're talking about oh, Eric Oakley. Yes, there you He's go. He's never that's he doesn't belong on there. He has a, he has a win. No, he doesn't. You're, you're going against no, Edwin Stats. No, no, no. Yes, you're, 100%. you're going against Edwin, Edwin Stats. Edwin is wrong. Yes, Edwin is. All right, Edwin, wrong. they're fact checking you. Eric Oakley, they're saying does not have a win. Oh, uh, does Nathan Queen count? 
Nathan Queen win. Didn't we uh, say Barsby? Barsby does not have one. He's not on. No, here. he was 2018. And he also the silver that so bit. That Sula or what was the one that he won with the axe? That was I think that was a silver bit. Um, you're missing. Oh Antala. gosh. Yes. Boom. Nailed Antala. it. And then I think you're missing. Did you guys say Cole Rodallin? I think you did, right? No. No. Okay, well, I gave you, not. Well, I gave you that one. You're okay. The last one you're missing then is um it was probably the least watched lead card in tournament history. No one was watching the final round. No one was on lead card. Everyone was on second card that, or third card. That was Matty O's win. No. <laughs> yeah. By <bye>, bro. <laughs> Or not, but I keep calling it by that MVP. Open. No, this this card had well, our lead card people. was stacked back then. This this lead card had less people. Dude, I had the guy in my mind, and you just West, let me let me let me go. West let Coast, me, let... West Coast. That's your last hint. It's not that many tournaments. Wait, OTB. Oh, Emerson, Emerson Key. Yeah. There you go. Let's go. All right, we He's need to get fat... becoming a daddy today. Or tomorrow. Oh, wow. or congratulations. Soon, I, think. I think his shout yeah, out to Emerson. Congratulations. Like... Yeah. All right. Uh Edwin, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to fact check yourself here on the Eric Oakley. They're he claiming doesn't, he doesn't need to. He didn't win. What what is that win? What did you think he what do you think? Is there a win that he has that you guys claim isn't a real win? Is that what's going on? Oh no, he just Eric Oakley was leading the tour championship after the first round of 2020. So Yuli is correct. Oh, so, oh, wow. All right, there is. You're right. Eric Oakley, not on there. Um, all right. Kristen Tatar, the only time you guys will ever hear me, the only time you guys will ever hear me talk about ratings, Kristen Tatar is still at 999. <laughs> How is that possible? Today yeah, today yeah. was an update. Kristen Tatar is still oh, at 999. She was at 999 last rate. I don't know how that's possible that you can have that many tournaments rounds fall off. <laughs> and Simon went down. And, <laughs> and that tournament and that so many bad. tournament rains coming in and still stay at 999. Do you, Simon, do you think she'll ever hit a thousand? I do. I'm a strong believer that you will. At least I hope I think, and I believe. Well, what about Owens kind of playing nasty? Like, I think she's 989 or 986. She's so she's up, kind man. of sneaking up there as well. Yeah. Um, but th th there's no shot she stays 999 for three, three <laughs> updates in a row, right? That's impossible. Seems unlikely, but... I don't know. I've been watching almost every single FPO round live before my own rounds this year. And just looking how they're playing, looking flex, what they're averaging okay. in scores. Oh, because I'm teeing off so late. I don't tee off that late. It's just barely enough to watch FPO. <laughs> okay, well, I'm teeing off when they're teeing off, Simon. So a little bit of a okay. flex, a little bit of a flex. <laughs> Maybe mild flex, but not intended. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm just looking at their averages and their scores and it's it seems just like a matter of time to me a bit this season. Yeah. It just seems like it's going to happen. Yeah. They need to play more events with more, uh, with a bigger field. Cause then, then their ratings will get boosted up. Um, it's, it's, I think it is difficult when you have, you know, 15, 20, 30 people that are all roughly about the same skill level playing together to really get those ratings high, but their fields are getting bigger. So the ratings are, they can have like their, the ceiling becomes a lot higher. Right. You can, you can have the people at the bottom make the course look a lot harder than, they, than it actually is. Uh, did you see this, guys? Disc golf in Europe is... I mean, I, I've been seeing this a lot about people being frustrated with the lack of marketing coming out of American tournaments. Just in the local... I'm seeing a lot of local people say, like, the Disc Golf Pro Tour shows up. They don't do really much marketing at all to get people to come out. Have you guys seen these over in um, Estonia getting ready for the disc golf superstars at Tallinn song festival? So this is like a massive billboard on the side of a highway 
that has Isaac Robinson wow. and Kristen Tatar on it. And then the other one is like at a bus stop and it's just a nice, I mean, so I'm telling cool. I made I Simon, I said this, I don't know if it was last podcast or two weeks ago. I said, I think the sport of disc golf is in the hands of Europe. I think Europe is actually going to be the driving force of making disc golf more popular and getting more people to play it than actually in the States. Because I see so much. I mean, you have Nicholas winning and like, he's all over everywhere in Finland after he won. We had Annika on, she was talking about how she was on like national news after she won. And I was just saying like AB won twice. I don't know if he made it into his local paper. No, no, he didn't. Right. And so it's like, I mean, do you think, do you think there could be a potential of where right now, obviously a lot of the effort and, and uh, money is in the States. Do you see that there could be a switch to where 15, 10% is in Europe right now. And the rest is in America. Do you think that could switch to where now in the States, there's a couple tournaments, but most of the tour is in, in Europe. I think there might be a world where I don't know how many years from now, I would say at least four, maybe three, maybe, but probably more between five and 10 years from now, we might see some kind of switch where the big events will mostly be in Europe. And a lot of U.S. players will have to make a choice to decide to start touring more in Europe because I truly believe that we'll see the first six-figure prize for first at a European event. Ooh. I think we'll see the big sponsors like car sponsorships, any kind of big, big brand sponsorships, whatever it might be, will most likely happen in Europe. And that's where the big money is going to come. But I think for the actual like disc golf network and most of the pros to be over in Europe, it's probably going to take a couple, a couple more years. I think disc golf could be cycling guys. I think it could be cycling where it's only going to get really crazy popular. If we have like a Lance Armstrong, right. But I could see it to where like the tour de France, like cycling in Europe is massive, massive. Nobody cares about it here. Um, there's so many, many disc golf courses in the United States though. And then to top it off, like the weather, like weather here, you can find a place to play year round. Like yeah, you can but if find it's way more popular over there, Yuli. Why are we? Why? Why would they not Dude, go over there? Where are you gonna? Pl- are you gonna play in the dark? Well, I mean, there's a. I mean, there's. there's <laughs> in the I mean, in the, uh, there's, there's a there's a European tour. I mean, there's a bunch of other sports that go on over there. Dur- like you gonna play in the snow all day? <laughs> no, there's a European tour. Uh, they they have it figured out. I mean, you yeah. can definitely have a tour over there. I'm just saying, like. Yeah, you just go like to Spain and I don't know. What if it's like just way it's bigger not, over there? Well, it's like Finland, it's very, very popular. Estonia, it's very, very popular. Sweden, popular. Uh Norway, popular. Um Denmark. It's just where, you have where a, else are you where else where else are you? You have like you just have like a you have like a way smaller barrier of entry. That's, that's kind of my whole MO is in the States. You have to break through so many different, like right, so many different sponsors. sports. I mean, you look at, look at skiing, right? Like skiing, they, they have the Nordic countries. They don't really need every, I mean, was skiing big in Germany, Simon? Very big. Yeah. Very big. But, but the Nordic countries yeah, were because like, it's uh, snowing the, there all the time. <laughs> It just well, something. Germany has Austria and Switzerland, which are famous for their the Alps, the Alps, uh, yeah, great it's skiing just resorts. To, but something to think about. I have hopes that some big sponsor one day, I don't know how many years from now, will build the first proper disc golf arena style, oh. almost course, mm. like the first time we feel like we have a freaking stage on a legit property that like let's say like a million dollar disc golf course um 
sponsored by i'm just throwing porsche out there because christian just signed a, a sponsor deal with porsche and i mean how sick would that be like freaking yeah a porsche disc golf course like that's stuff that like i know finland already has a ford disc golf course that ford sponsors and they have like an indoor uh big soccer field that is available for disc golfers as well um right on the property and I mean, that I just, kind of stuff is going to start popping up here and there in the Nordic countries. And if, if it pops up there and if it's successful, then maybe the warmer regions like Spain, Portugal, Italy yeah. will fall suit, suit baby. You got, you got, you know. Come on, yeah, may, Maybe in 20 years, but there's no way you're convincing <laughs> me on this. There's just no way. Here's part of the reason why these places aren't getting sold out. We're in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Like... There are places right now where we could be having tournaments where disc golf is so popular where you would sell thousands of tickets. We are not there. Part of the reason is, like Simon was saying, we don't have like I can, great Paul, courses. Paul. What I want to know your answer on this question. I would did an okay. Instagram question uh, whenever I did all these Instagram polls. I asked, is it... Would it be more beneficial for disc golf or let's say just the pro tour to play in a great location on a mediocre course, or would it be better to play on a great course in kind of a crappy mediocre location? And it was like 75, 25 in favor of the course is more important than the location. And sure. I don't think I could disagree more. I think yeah, same. if he was we crossing. played on a mediocre course, in a great location, I think that would be way better for with you. the growth of the sport. Absolutely. Than playing on a great course in a crappy location. Like, right. I, mean, I don't want to name <laughs> any that, names right now, but we all know. Well, I was just, I was just saying, like, Eagles Crossing but, is that course, Simon, that you were saying, I can't wait for someone to make a sick course. Like, hole one at Eagles Crossing, like, you can build but huge. The location. You, I, the that's location. the problem. It's in the middle of nowhere. And that's yeah. why I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I think I even had the, the thing of saying like, what if we just had 10 events in Charlotte? I think that would help the sport. I think that would Same. be good. Same. I think, I think you yeah. would have a lot, 10 events in Charlotte. Stop, stop charging $150 for tickets. Stop charging people to come out and have to, to watch. I get the practice round somewhat. Cause they're trying to pay some of the players, but again, like, I think the players would all be in on it. If we all kind of got together and we're like, Hey, listen, we're going to change all this stuff up so that more people can come and watch. And it's easier. The barrier of entry right now to go to a disc golf yeah. tournament is crazy. It's way too expensive, man. It's way too expensive. You're, you're only getting like diehards yeah. showing up. I mean, what about, <sighs> I feel like we have some good locations. I do. But one of the things that Austin's I feel great. like Austin's isn't, good. isn't so good is there's so many events. Like what if we just had like 15 events a year and they were just the best events ever. And then the athletes just train the whole time for these 15 events. Like, do you, do you want to know my reason why I think we don't have that? Is I think Why? the disc golf network. Well, yeah, well, yeah, it's a business and they need to make money. They need a, they I need know. a product to be able to show everybody. But, but I think if they weren't charging, if they weren't charging like a monthly fee <laughs> to be on it, yeah, then there wouldn't be this idea of like, we need to have multiple events every month so that people are continuing to pay for their subscription. Back to the main point. Yeah. I think disc golf moving to Europe is absolutely nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> It's absolutely, I'm calling you guys out. Like it's absolutely not. Right. That's not, that's not our problem. Hey, 10 years from now, Silas, run and this. I love it. Silas, I love it. 10 years there. from now when yeah, Yuli's yeah. living in, in, uh, Hey, 10 years is Yuli not Jr. Is living, living in 10. Europe playing disc golf over there. <laughs> yeah. For I'm going to be playing at 45, 45. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You would for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Simon, you tapping out. Hey. You still good. No, we. I want to just say that we need bigger crowds, which means we need to go to yes. better locations where there's more people. Cheaper tickets. 100%. And one of the... Uh, this is a bit strange point right now, a bit off track, but what infuriates me sometimes when I'm watching live is the camera positions they choose to film from. Oh, my. 
like, for, for example, I watched Owen win some tournament last year, and she tapped out her last putt, was celebrating, and the camera was just, like, on her with a bush in the background. Not one fan <laughs> was around her. Just her and the bush in the background. She was, like, giving her speech and, like, all happy, lifting her trophy. Like, the the audience, the gallery, needs to be involved in shots like that. Like, it needs to look fun and exciting to be at a disc golf event, not like the players are For out sure. there That's a good point. with a bush. Yeah, well, you know what they point. do, and I just see it all the time where I'm like, put the gallery there and have the camera stand. So it's, the, cal- the gallery needs to be in frame. It needs to look because, like we're, this is cool. Yeah, and other sports actually do the exact opposite of where they realize, hey, we're in a stadium. There's not that many people here, so we're not going to film the stadium, right? Like they do their best to hit shots to where they don't show a stadium with 50 people in it. Yeah. But what you're saying is like, we need to show that at least there's like 50 people around the basket and you're not yeah. just putting in a field by yourself. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, yeah. That's a good point. One of the saddest things I saw this year was the all-star event oh and Ooh, at the putting competition was... or the putting, whatever yeah, you call it. That was they rough. were like, I, I don't watchable. know how many people were there. Let's say 50 people. And they were all like 80 feet away from the basket scattered in the distance like, especially at a showcase event like that, like, there's just, like, the best eight players there just to show off and have a good time. Like, bring the gallery right next to the basket and have them freaking celebrate every putt that goes in or that is close, whatever. Like, it needs to be, it needs to look like a party and not, like, there's 20 people scattered watching and the <laughs> pros kind of just, like, doing their thing. That's, it, 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 it hurt my soul watching that a bit. Yeah, it it is tough. Some of the uh, views, some of the images you get while watching live, they they should never do the drone. The drone should never be used to show the crowd, um, because that just really you can just look at it and be like, "There's <laughs> there's 50 people at this tournament." Like, the, like don't ever use the drone. Hey, we're um, not doing a good job. We're like giving away all the secrets that there's like nobody ever there at anything. <laughs> I mean, these, we, we got to stop uh-huh. making these tournaments look like Simon meet and greets. You know, we got to, we got to start making <laughs> them look like people are actually showing up here. Hey, um, here's, here's a good plug. If you are in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and yeah. you haven't gotten a ticket to come out this weekend, do it. Tickets? It's, it's awesome. I mean, it we all have fun. This call is sick to watch. Yeah. I would highly recommend so, coming to check it out. I'm not, I'm not bashing anyone of the gallery. No. It's like, the production. No. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but we are saying we want more people out there. It's better for us. It's better for the players. A hundred percent. It's better for everybody. I, it's one of those things of where it's like, do you, you know, do you get a hundred people and you charge them 50 bucks or do you get a thousand people and you charge them five? Or do you do it for free? Like in Europe? or you do it completely free and you're just like, Hey, we're going to try to get as many people on this as possible to make people think, Holy crap, we, we got to be involved. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's, it's Running uh, events honest, is probably way harder than we think. <laughs> no, it is. It is a hundred percent, but there's like, there's oh, for sure. Th- there's different, uh, there's different mentalities too. And you know, Simon, going back to like the YouTube side of things, if you would have started doing YouTube right from the get go and we're like, I need to make money and you were doing like random ad deal reads throughout the entire time, like every single video, when you started, that's really hard. Like you have, like you kind of have to slowly transition into that process. And I think that's something that maybe the disc golf pro tour kind of missed was like, let's just try to get people to come out to tournaments. And now, I don't know. Now they have to try to make money because you know, they, I, I don't know. They're in a tough spot. They're not in an easy spot by any means, but yeah, getting local schools involved. That's a perfect, a perfect thing. Go, go to schools and bring in, you know, buses, loads of kids for free like that. Yeah. It's uh, I don't know. All right. Let's, let's talk about some statistics. Uh, I'm just going to run through the leaders uh, in each stat here. And you guys stop me. If you, if anything kind of jars you, so you got Anthony Barella leading right now this year at 55% uh, birdie rate, 
which is insane. There's actually three people over 50%. Kyle Klein, Gannon Burr, and Anthony Barella are birding more than uh, ev- they're birding more than every other hole, which is absolutely insane. Kyle K- Klein is leading in driving accuracy at 84%. Anthony Barella is leading in greens and C1 and reg at 53%. Gannon Burr is leading in greens and reg for C2 at 75%. He's actually tied with a B. So those guys are hitting, those guys are having a birdie putt inside of 60 feet, three out of every four holes. That's crazy. That's stupid. Uh, scrambling Gannon Burr, 66%. Paul Uliberry, number one, C one X putting 94%. Fake stat. Fake stat. Okay. It's actually, it's actually wrong. It's wrong. C2 putting James Proctor. No surprise there. 44%. Do you guys know who this Milcheski guy is? I've never heard of that. Milcheski. What's his first name? It's just a C. Chris? I don't know. Uh, no, no, no. I think, I think it's... Oh, wait. I don't remember. I think I played with him in Waco. Okay. Well, he's really good at putting circle two. Uh, Joey Tamale. 41%. He's actually in third for circle two putting. That's sick. Nasty putter. Dude, yeah, uh, he's been, yeah, wow. Oh, and this this Milech, this Milcheski guy is leading an average distance of putts made at 18.6. So he's either not throwing the disc ever close to the basket or he's just a nasty putter <laughs> or both. And then if he, if he misses a circle one putt, he's like missing he air balling it. To, yeah. <laughs> he just can't make putts. He only, uh, Edwin just said he only has six misses. Wait, total? In circle two? It has to be in circle two, right? Six misses total would be insane stat. Like how many tournaments are in this stat? They have to have played three tournaments this year. He's wow. played three events? Yeah. Oh, no, okay. Yuli, they're saying that you've only missed six inside the circle. Is that accurate, you think, or do you, have you missed more? Or missed less? It's, I've missed less. Miss less. Oh wow! So you're yeah. better. You're better than a stat show. Yeah, like like yeah. A, the stat guys are off a little bit. All right. Um, we That's insane, Yuli. T- how do you do it? Yeah. What is, your, do you do what, it? what is your what is your what is your your trick for everyone that wants to work on their putting? Dude, I have actually a crazy. I already trick. listened to this reel. <laughs> I've, I've listened to it already. I don't want to hear it again. All right, next. Go on. All right. No, um, no, no. Let's hear it. I have, I came up with a theory. Okay. And this changed my putting in the circle. I came up with a theory that if the movement of my putting stroke starts from my fingertips, so like the movement upward, if it starts there, I'm directly, and I have the same pressure over my putt, like the grip. So there's no like more pressure on my middle fingers, more, no more pressure on this index finger or my pinky or anything. What is the pressure from zero to 10? Um, That's a loaded question. I I, I wouldn't know. Whatever you're comfortable with releasing, like whatever your comfortable grip is, wherever that pressures, wherever that pressure is on your hand, whatever you're used to, make that pressure through the whole hand. Okay. And then if you start the movement from back here, so that means like I'm not driving the whole arm up and the pressure is all even and you're moving from your fingertips, that's where the movement starts. So instead of this, I'm going like out. Okay. I think in your brain is directly now connected to where you're going to release. So if this goes, your brain has to go, okay, calculate that. Now I have to time where I got to release, right? Okay. But I think if the movement starts here first and I'm moving up to my spot of release, I have a direct line in contact with where I'm going to release it. At least that's what I'm telling myself and tricking myself if that's not correct. But if it is, I can slow down and make sure that I hit my spot wherever I'm trying to release the disc. And there's a there's no garbage in between. So there's no movements. My brain has to calculate okay. if that makes sense. I'm just going, okay. Like where my thought is when I'm putting in the circle is, okay, where's my hand at, at the bottom of my stroke. 
And then I just make sure that I'm pulling from the bottom of my fingertips. That's the only movement I'm calculating. I'm not calculating anything else. And then I'm just trying to release it at a certain spot. That's it. That's the only thing I've changed. And since I've done that, it's been, it's been pretty dang easy. Hmm. It might change. I mean, we always have four things that we do. Hmm? I was quick shout out for the fish bra podcast because i was mm, listening to andrew your episode fish. there with andrew fish um one of my favorite podcasts by the way i love <laughs> i think he's, he's good he's good um you had like some robot story about your putting there but people should go over and well, listen that... to that if they want to hear a different version of you explaining a circle one putt because that's also very funny right well that was like a few years ago but this is why lately i've been putting so good because it's that mixed in with this like putting form ago? whatever oh, okay getting in position and then this this thing i really think it's like brilliant because then you're not if your brain doesn't have to calculate the arm going forward the wrist breaking to get to hear your fingers popping then it's one thing you got to do you got to move it up and then release it where you'd like so that's it I don't know. It's probably hard to understand over a podcast. It'd be more like a show and tell, but I, I think that I'm onto something anyway. Yuli does lessons. Go check them out. Um, all right, Simon, I want your honest opinion. We have our stats guy. He puts together like a, like almost like a Madden, like an NFL, like kind of attributes the stats, like of where your statistics would be. If you're like a creative player, and so if you're like a video game, this is what your stats would be. Up, and I want your honest opinion. So we can pull it up here. Oh, so like you a might soccer be able to card. Stick. Yes, kind of. Well, okay. so let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one where it's just the, where it's just Simon and the stats. Uh, let me text it to you real quick here. Pull that one down then. Cause that's too, too small. Here, I'll text it to you. That was too much information. That was like a, a restaurant with a bad menu, man. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I need more pictures. Well, that, that, was, just... that was showing that he, we'll, we'll probably post this on Twitter at some point, but that was showing basically all Simon's stats from 2023 versus 2024. But we kind of already discussed a lot of that. So I didn't want to go. I didn't want to have to rehash that. Um, all right, so here it is. Here we go. So scoring, 97. Power, 98. Accuracy, 94. Scramble, 94. Putting, 90. Overall, 95. How do you feel about that? Did he, did he do it right? Did he get any of them wrong? Um... I feel like that's pretty good. Scoring 97 might be a bit high. I, I've never really been a good scorer. I feel like that's always been like my lack is scoring properly or smartly. Mm. Um, but he probably knows my stats and games way better oh, he does. than I do. Oh, he does. <laughs> 85, Wait, is the so av- 85 is the average, 95 by the way. 95 seems like... 85 is the average. Yeah, so you can only 100, so high. 100 is perfect, and then uh, I believe 70 is the bottom. So, What's the highest? Do we know? Uh, you're the, the highest? highest. You're the highest so far. I don't think you're the highest on tour, but you're the highest so far that we've had okay. this uh, graphic made. Uh, scoring I think is power should be 99. Score, not 98. Well, he left. He left 99 for AB. So if you want to. Do you want to do you take have more power to the more power is that what you're to say right now? or equal? Do you have oh, equal power? It, wait, is this for like right now? Yes. These are your stats oh. right now. So, so your scoring, oh, I thought this is kind of like combining my like career. No, kind no, of no, no, no. This is right years. now. So your scoring Simon is your, your birdie rate and net score per round. So that's where that's coming from. But so when I'm he, in like 30th every tournament. So, so I'm in 95 overall. So what he, well, you're probably getting a lot of bogeys. Um, so what he's doing is he's basically taking everyone's statistics and then ranks oh them, ranks them off of that. So there's only a couple people are, that well, are higher than are you. We, are we sure these are, I'm sorry to throw this out there, but are we sure these are for Simon? 
Why? I've seen the typo. Yeah, it seems like no. It says FPO rank FPO number rank. nine. Is this is this an FPO player? Uh oh. I think but I think is the that, is that is Tatar? Correct. I think. <laughs> well, the rating is oh, yeah, ten thirty. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I think I think the FPO might be a typo from typo. the last. Okay. I think the last time he made it was for an FPO player. Okay. Um, okay. I think everything else was used. He, yeah, you this, was, yeah, this um, was a template off of Missy Gannon, so you just okay, forgot. To, okay, he okay. forgot to change the FPO to MPO. Honest mistake. Honest uh, okay. Mistake. So yeah, this. I feel like if it's right now, it's a, I'm a bit overrated according to that card. Oh. But okay. A little overrated. Okay. There you go. I mean, right now my power being one below AB. Well, yeah, we have accurate. to go back to this. Do you want to be 99 with AB? Do you think you should be there? I mean, historically, and I would say overall in my career, I'm a 99, but right now I'm like a 92 at best. Yeah, these are from last year too, by the way, Simon. So it's not accounting for this year's tournaments. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would put everything like one or two down. Okay. Just to be more humbled. Except for power. <laughs> Except for power. <laughs> well, power... You can do the thing where you like, like you drop you drop an attribute for one of them and it gives you the ability to bump one up for the other one. Oh, so yeah, you, I like that. You, yeah. yeah. You're you building see. your own player at this exactly. point. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, what what I'm would really you disappointed? I'm really disappointed that my putting is significantly lower than any other stat. I don't want that to be the reality, but I guess it is the reality. It is it. I mean, you just saw freaking Milcheski. Is putting, you know, average putts 19 feet. That's who the people you're dealing with now. You're dealing with Macheskis out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, people right. are freaking putting freaks. Oh, man, all right, here's so a, good at putting. It, like, blows my mind. Here's a wild story for you. I guess I guess throw this photo up while I say this story. I haven't read this yet. I just saw the photo. I don't know what we're looking at here. Um, okay, so this is coming oh, wow. in from Josh. He says, I played in a C tier last year. And I'd been raining a decent amount leading up to the event. I was aware that this course plays next to a river or on several holes. So I messaged the TD the day before the event to ask if he had checked the course to make sure everything was good to go. He said he wasn't concerned and everything was good. Well, we show up to the course and start the round. Um, we come up to one of the holes that plays next to the river and the water had risen so much that it was almost touching the basket. We called the TD and asked how to play the hole. He basically said that if you can find a disc in the water, then you can play from it. So players were literally walking in the water past their knees, searching for their disc and then putting within the river. If they were able to find it, have you, <laughs> I mean, this guy's, it looks like he, I don't, you know, I don't want to judge, but it looks like he took his pants off um, <laughs> or, or he's wearing extremely short shorts the short and shorts are in right now. They are in Tristan Tanner for sure. But you can see like there's a dock in the background in the, the basket. I mean, wh what are you guys doing in this scenario? I, I'm not going in to look for my disc. I'm not playing that tournament. <laughs> you love these tournaments, Yuli. These are your tournaments. So, yeah. I, I, not at, not at a, not when it's raining. I am a fair weather <laughs> tournament golfer at this point in my life. Simon, you going in there to make your 15 foot birdie putt in the water? I'm a huge fan of play where it lies. I wish we would do it more. I mean, <laughs> I've seen freaking pro golfers take off yes. their shoes and go hit when they're like right on the edge. They like stand in the water and hit that thing. Yep. Freaking play it where it lies. That is the most basic idea of golf is you play it from where you freaking hit that thing. In disc golf, we should throw it from where we freaking threw that thing. But no, we need freaking OB and hazards all over the freaking place. So, what if you guys I was think? in that tournament, I golf. would walk in there. Yes, I, if I was in the tournament, I'm going yeah. in the I'm going in the water. What do you guys think about be, uh, taking off your shoes is illegal? Do you think that like you have to walk in there with your shoes? Do you think that's a stupid rule? I don't really know what the reason is behind the rule. If they give well, me a good reason, it's why it's a, I think it's, it's probably a safety issue. Well, I think it's also to stop people from playing barefoot because people would just play barefoot. Yeah, you're right. I think it's a fine rule. I think you should play with shoes on. 
just just go in and now you have the the most mildewy shoes the rest of the round. <laughs> you better you better I uh, done it. You better not lose to that person on that hole because the next T pad is gonna be soaking wet. <laughs> uh oh. All right. Is this possibly the worst scorecard graphic you guys have ever seen? Now take a good look at this because you need a one. First off, these guys were all playing the same course. So first off, look at the pars. Oh, GK pro guys. Yeah. Look, look at the pars on hole 11 for drew. He, he drew played it as a par four, but the other guys all played that hole as a par five. But then also if you look like, you have a blue, like you have a, you have a red five that's two over. And then, and then you have a red four. That's one over par. Too any, many colors. Any, any thoughts on this guys? <laughs> yeah. On this scorecard, there should only be red, green and gray. I Just think. birdie over par under par par okay yeah yeah Th this was Keep this was simple. maybe the busiest scorecard i've ever seen and it's pos possibly the worst scorecard i've ever seen uh next next question would you guys ever get a disc golf tattoo no no okay easy enough um all right we're gonna keep moving on uh putting punishment if you guys didn't witness this this went down in foundation disc golf we, you had Hunter had to make a thousand putts. Connor had to make a thousand putts. Trevor had to make 2000 putts from 30 feet. I, oh my God. I decided to join them because I was like, Hey, if they're dealing the, with, the, with the pain, let me do it as well. I thought it was a good idea. That was after my first workout back from the gym and I did shoulders and back. And the lactic acid after like the first 30 minutes started building up. I was having a hard time lifting my arm. It was really bad. But if you guys were completely fresh, how long do you think it would take you to make a thousand putts from 30 feet? And obviously you have to go and retrieve the disc and bring them back. You're not just able to rapid fire, right? So you can account, account that as well. I, I will know this pretty on the spot, I think. Because I always used to do a hundred with a stack of ten putters. Same, and that would take you're me like putting, 15 you're minutes. You're putting until you make a hundred of them. No, just throw a hundred putts with like oh. intention. Okay, and so you make maybe ninety five of them or ninety of them. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh wait, you have to make a thousand putts, or you gotta yeah throw yeah. a thousand putts. What? Simon, oh, you make make a thousand putts. throwing a thousand putts, I'd be done so fast. I would just put it. You have to make a thousand. Yeah, so when you start getting tired at the end oh. and you go through a batch oh, of 40 okay. and you only make 25, <laughs> you, you got a number in mind or are you calculating right now? Calculating. Okay. I'll give you, I'll, I think Hunter did it in three hours and 20 minutes. And I think I was going to say two and a half hours. Okay. I was going to say two and a half hours. All right. We did the same calculations then. Maybe that's well, a future, I, I future three video hours idea. Would be, Three hours should be like normal, but if you go fast, two and a half. Because you also have to think too. I mean, the other thing too is I did I did this from twenty five feet a couple years ago, and this is when I was working out and putting all the time, and I never really got tired. My muscle endurance for putting is is awful right now, like it's really bad. So. um Something to think about. Maybe try it home. It wouldn't oh. be a good thing for me to do with my shoulder. No way. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I don't think it'd be good. Oh, we've got uh, we got some more Edwin stats here. Simon was ninth in C1X putting last year, but 27th in C2. So he weighted averages to 90% with 85% average for top 57 players that played at least 15 events in 2023. And then also Corbin, uh, Corbin, Corbin Milcheski, has played all Corbin. four yeah, tournaments so far this year. His average finish has been 80. But he That's just why makes I it. it with him in Waco. <laughs> when I got Wait, 80. Is he just launching the disc all over Did the place? He, time he's a new song. Did he make a bunch of long putts? 
Man, my freaking memory. I, Waco, I wiped straight out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, just cockling his putters yeah. all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Corbin. Um, Corbin. Was it Waco or did I play with him in Austin? I don't even remember the tournament. Ah. I don't remember any of that stuff. Reminder 2024 Tour Series discs are currently out right now uh, uh, for Discraft. So go pick some up. Simon, you got any tour series or anything like that going on? I'll have a tour series coming out later this year. I'm not exactly sure when, but it's going to be really cool. Okay. I'm sure everyone will be looking forward to that. Our retail store grand reopening will be on April 12th this Friday. So don't miss that. And then we have a couple of listener questions. Actually, we have one listener question and it's not for any one of us. It's actually for our producer, Silas. This is from Kyle Silas. Here you go. Is there a strategy on how you choose the Silas selects for the other foundation podcast? And do you want to kind of explain what the Silas select is for people that maybe don't watch the other podcasts? Okay. So the Silas select is the grip locked. Uh, it's basically like a lottery. Cause I think they got it off of the, Pardon my take does something like this. Yep. Some kind of barstool. They have a lottery ball at the end. Yeah, yep. some kind of yep. barstool podcast. You know, it's just a it's just a for fun thing. It's just a, hey, we got lucky. We selected a number. So basically, they just asked me to pick a disc out of the retail store, put it in a box, and at the end of each episode, they'll go and try and guess and see if they got the mold right or if they got it wrong. And it's just kind of a fun thing. And so, no, it, no, I don't have a, I don't have a strategy, but I like to, I like to keep it fun and I like to keep it interesting. So I'm not going to, you know, pull some like random, you know, I'm trying to pick something that they might be able to get, but it's not impossible if that makes sense. Right. Have you ever done the same disc back to back weeks? No, I haven't done that yet. Oh. Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Yeah. Um, has anyone watched this week's Grip Locked? Yeah. Simon Yuli? No, no, Simon oh. Yuli. Have you guys watched it? Okay, then we're some of it. But you didn't watch the end. I might have not made made it to the end. Okay. So we can all guess right now. So we have to guess a disc, and we'll see if any of us can guess it, because we, we none of us have seen Wait, it. Wait, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it this week. There, there is no, there is no size selects this week, because we are moving. Well, we're, what the hell? We're, we are moving. <laughs> Did you do one last week? I yeah. think I might know last yeah. week's. What? what you do guys want to guess last? You guys want to guess last week's? Sure. I definitely didn't see it, so I could. All right, go for it. <laughs> We'll end it on this. Someone's going to guess it. Hmm. Blank. <laughs> blank what exactly top. are we waiting for now? No, you say a disc. You're just saying a disc that you think Silas picked out of our warehouse. Oh. Uh, oh. Wait, we're I, just guessing? What are we guessing? Like, give us an example. Like, we're just saying a mold? Any mold? Yes. You so just go. Silas literally just picks a disc, puts it in a box, and they have to try to guess what disc it is. That's the game. That's the game. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so Sorry. we have like a thousand options right here. Uh, there can't be that many molds. I don't know how big your warehouse is. I think there's. Well, no, it's out. It's out of the uh, the retail store. So not. Oh, it's every out of retail. Mold. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe like a hundred store. Maybe like a hundred molds then. And we don't even know the brand or any tips. Uh, it's just no. you gotta guess any no. disc. Yeah. That'll be wow. in the retail store. I have a good guess. I think I know what it is actually. Wait, how how is there a good and a bad guess here? Because uh, I think I remember what it was. I watched it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> While Silas likes doesn't even matter what he likes. I don't even know what he likes. Um, he's trying say, to, but he did give us a clue. He said he's picking, he's going to pick something yep, that that's not guess. that, that you could guess. So I'm going to go with uh, Athena. Okay. Oh, you're going Discraft and I won't go Discraft. I'll go with. Don't know a bunch of other molds. Dynamic discs. <laughs> and dynamic discs. 
Wait, now I gotta know a dynamic is small. Oh. <laughs> That's why. Just I'm pick an one. MVP felon. one. Felon. We all know you want to. No, Felon. Felon's right, I, a good one. I'm I think it. I think it was actually the Buzz Boys. I think it was the Buzz. Yeah. I was... It was. A, it was the Buzz. It was the yeah! Buzz. <laughs> one for one. I'm the greatest ever. <laughs> oh man. Good memory. Uh, I, for some reason, I thought I, I remember being like, "Oh wow, that was actually really easy." But none of it would be easy. Now we can oh, play my game. Oh, what's your game? Uh, I have, I have one disc in this box. Why do you have only one disc in that massive box? You need to tell MVP to, to, to efficiently ship their discs. I'm wasting a lot of cardboard there, Simon. If you guess the disc, I will do a giveaway. Oh. Okay, so it has to be and MVP. I'll tell you it's an MVP mold. Okay. All right, let's start thinking Simon MVP moles. Pixel. Time lapse. Um, I'll give you a clue. Wait. That's the clue you get. Wait, what's the clue? Your hand? You see the your, rim. You wait, see your the rim hand? of the disc. I can't see crap. It's like crap. a driver. It's a drag. It's a driver. I can't see crap. Oh, I well, just the, made... color, the color of the rim should give you the clue. Oh, Axiom versus... Uh, oh, I just learned this. It's Axiom. I think Axiom is black. Um, the room. Oh, let me make your screen bigger. All right, let me see it. Like maybe behind the wall, you can see it better. Oh, okay. It's black with. I can't see the rim at all. I just see it's black. Oh, it's an envy. It's an envy. I'm gonna go envy. Uh, Yuli, you go. Uh, go inertia. Go inertia. I'm gonna go inertia. It, envy and inertia. It's a matrix. You oh lost. come on, chat! What the heck! Good game. Me, Good game everyone, everyone was telling me to go inertia. Do I have a disc in here? This. All right, my turn. Oh, who's that? Is that Paul? It is. Okay, my game. Hold on, here's my game. That's a lid. No, it's not. That's my game. Ten, five, zero, two. Wait, what? That's my game. Athena. Is that Athena, Athena or Onyx? This I'm is my. Go... No, is my Athena game. is less. Onyx is not that stable. That disc is really Stop. stable. I'm gonna oh, go you, Onyx. Yuli's cheating. Yuli's cheating. Yuli, what was your guess? Uh, let me guess. Uh, what is that? Uh, what about a machete? Votorious! Votorious! Oh, All right, Yuli, you have to finish one. We each did a game. You have to finish with the game. All right, no, I'm grabbing something. I didn't want you guys to see what I'm grabbing. Oh, you're being mysterious. Okay. A bunch of chat got yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, th we have some disc heads in the chat. No one, no one got yours, Simon. <clears throat> Matrix is a. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Not an easy one to get. Oh, here we go. Let's go this way. I'll just show you the stamp from far away. That's easy. Comet. Wait, is this stamp supposed to help us somehow? No, it's a discraft disc. I'm just disc. doing it this far away. I know, but... Yeah, it's, it's a discraft disc. I feel like that stamp's been on a lot of discs, though. Sure. Sure has. It looks like a mid, the way he's holding it, because his fingers are kind of close. It does weigh a mid. I'm going to go... <laughs> I already got it. Comment. It's a comment. I'm going to go... Oh, gosh. I'm going to go... Buzz OS. All right, I'm going to say this. It's like a, it's a disc I'm kind of known for, but not the obvious one. Nuke. It's not Raptor. It's an ESP nuke. I got you with the stamp. <laughs> that is such this a, is a that, that's such a, uh, that's such a mid stamp. That doesn't, it's, that, that yeah. seems like it should go on a mid or a putter, not a distance driver. Yeah. All right. Um, we hit 30, 35,000 subscribers. Thank you guys so much for subscribing. All of our tour life crew members appreciate it. Um, how many lives do we have? 
We have over 1,300 people watching right now, which is pretty good. Okay. Uh, Simon, do you want some Tour Life merch? We can get some Tour Life merch sent to you. I think you're our number one guest. I think you've been on the show the most. Him or Calvin, Ooh. right? Yeah, him or Calvin are probably close <laughs> to being it. Yeah. We can I give you like merch. Yeah, we'll uh I'll shoot you. I want you. a hoodie. I'll, hoodie. I'll, I want hoodie. I'll, I'll text you the link and you can just tell me what you want style wise, because we have different kind of styles. So cool. I don't I don't want to send you something that you're not gonna wear. But uh speaking of merch, Silas, what are our numbers at? All right. Final well, final numbers for this week. We've got grip locked two sixty three. Okay. And Tour life is three thirteen. All right, very nice. Thank you guys for everyone that's supporting the channel. We appreciate it. Simon Yuli, you guys got anything else? I have a new pet peeve. Oh yes, we normally yes, don't. Ask, we normally don't ask this to reoccurring guests because it's like some people are like, I've already said, I don't know. I mean, it's a we, new rule on tour. You've probably talked about this 40 we times welcome already. It. We welcome it. Two, the freaking five minute rule, the new one. And oh, then the, the everyone has to keep score. <laughs> all I, right, you, I you can't you, stand it. Don't get you really started all. on the five minute rule. Don't hey, get you really started hey, on the same. Or with the scorecard, we're on the same page. Do you do you well, not like everyone keeping score because we're doing everyone's like, doing the same I, thing? I don't mind everybody keeping score. We should keep each other's score. We don't have to keep everybody's score. Like you should just pass it to the guy next to you. But anyways, that doesn't matter. The digital is silly. The digital is silly. We played a tournament. The digital went down. How is everybody going to keep score? It happened. The did the. the PDGA went down. We couldn't do it. That is so silly. But anyways, pet peeve, digital scorecard, mandatory. Maybe oh my they're, gosh. So maybe stupid. they're trying to be environmental friendly and going digital and not and going paperless. You know how all those people like, hey, you want to go paperless? Hey, you want to go paperless? Maybe they're, you know, environmental friendly. Yeah, I think they want people using their app. It's hard also, to cheat it now, which is nice. We're all on our phone between holes. Like everyone's just on their phone after every freaking hole. It's like, oh, it guess what? Like we're just... score conflict, score conflict, score conflict. Every other hole, yeah. <laughs> like, and then I'm like, it's you, it's you, it's you, and it's mine. <laughs> and I'm like, how did this even happen? I know I put the right score. In. There is some, yeah, there is some glitchiness to it, to where you sometimes input the right score and it initially says score conflict, and then it corrects itself yeah. later, but. Yeah, I don't. I, I agree with you, Simon. Like, I mean, sometimes. What is the new five minute rule for? Do we do we have an official statement on why they did that? It's just so people aren't showing up right before the tea time. And so the that the that guy bad? can tell you tell you about the potluck later. <laughs> about I, the what? I so so I think it's literally people were showing up like seconds before their tea time. And so what, 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 Yuli, right what Yuli was making a joke about is, you know how those guys always love to tell you about the fly Mart and Hey, use this code and you can go watch a movie for $5 and then uh, up later, bring your own dish. You know, there's a taxidermy going on that you can, you can get some, you know, they, <laughs> Kevin Jones show. Yeah. He's, Kevin Jones is performing the tonight. You, they, they <laughs> want to tell you all that information right before you throw. So they want to make sure you're there so you can hear all that information. And then also they're going to tell you the five or six holes that are playing differently today than they were yesterday that you have to remember how to play them the different way. I don't know. But half the time or more, you just stand there and wait awkwardly. Yes. Well, it's getting even weird too, because now you have cards. Two I think cards. two minutes should be the rule. You have having... two minutes early done. Like I'm Fair. not even, I'm not even showing up five minutes and 30 seconds. I'm showing up like eight minutes before. And so now I'm there with the card that is there waiting for the card before them to throw. So it's just like, you now I watch terrified. the previous card to you. Like, no. I'm terrified of getting there late. Yeah. I'm showing up there so it early. I'm so terrified. Stress while warming up. <laughs> yeah. It's so annoying. Well, also I put a timer a on my phone. To make sure that I, I refresh my upload for the PDGF. No, I'm just kidding. And then so that I have, I'm like 10, 
five minutes before five minutes. Yeah. Some of these courses like uh, Florida open was super stressful. Like that was not an easy, like that was uh, I, I definitely had a jog one time because I was like, Oh crap. Like leaving eight minutes before my tea time is not f- soon enough. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It, great pet peeve. Great pet peeve. Those are great pet peeves. Yuli, Yuli loves both of them, but all right, boys, okay. that was a fun one tonight. Appreciate okay. it. Good. Uh, good luck in Jonesboro. Both of you. I'll be watching. Hopefully, uh, hopefully watching you guys play. Um, and, I, and I'll see nice. you guys. I'll see you guys. In, uh, see you guys in Nashville. Yes, sir. All right, boys. Take in it Nashville. easy. Everyone. Thank you guys so much for watching. Appreciate it. We'll see you in the next one.